All right, it looks like we are on. Good afternoon and welcome. You know, as a typical black swan event, COVID-19 really took the world completely by surprise. It meant the entire landscape horticulture industry would have to sit idle while everyone did their part to flatten the curve. Well, here we are now experiencing some of the greatest demand for residential landscape services that we've ever seen. Many landscape companies I've spoken with say they're booked well into next year. Sales have not slowed down and demand continues at an all time high. While this is incredible for our profession, supply chains haven't quite been able to keep up with the demand. And this coupled with reduced profitability thrown in as brought a unique set of challenges to go along with navigating this pandemic. Hey everybody, I'm Joe Salemi, Deputy Executive Director with Landscape Ontario, and today's town hall is being recorded. We'll do our best to get the recording out to everyone as soon as uh, we can following our broadcast. There is a chat on the right-hand side of your screen, so please use it to engage with the panel that we have in front of us today. Please comment and ask questions and help us co-create the experience. Today we have an incredible lineup and here with us today are Alan White, Chair of the Landscape Ontario COVID Task Force and owner of Turf Systems in Burlington. Dave Wright, President of Landscape Ontario, owner of Wright Landscape Services in the Kitchener area. Peter Ganan, of, a member of the Landscape Ontario COVID-19 Task Force and CEO of Oriel Landscaping. And Lindsay Ross, member of the COVID-19 Task Force and owner of Living Green Landscaping in the Ottawa area. Now we do have a very special guest who's joining us again today, uh, Warren Coughlin. And after getting to know Warren, uh, and he shared a bit of info and some stories with me. And if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to share Warren's story with you uh, before I do hand it over to him. So Warren is a weirdo. A few days after birth, doctors told his parents that he had about zero chance of survival, but he lived. At 13, he lost all of his hair back when everyone was a hippie, but he never got bullied. He loved and studied his, and he loved and studied business, but was told by his classmates he was a communist for suggesting employers should consider the welfare of their staff in the decision making. He backpacked through Southeast Asia, helped fishermen in Tunisia, and became a Bay Street lawyer. Much to his father's dismay, he left law to become an, on, an entrepreneur. He co-owned a number of businesses in the new media space and facilitated the first national new media association in Canada and was one of the founders of the Canadian New Media Awards. He's also been a college professor, an actor, and theater director. He's now a business coach for entrepreneurs, especially ethical ones. He was affiliated with the world's largest business coaching organization and was their top Canadian coach for six years. He's also president of RTG Group, which stands for Receiving Through Giving, a highly innovative for-profit social enterprise that, among other things, helps organizations build high-performance cultures while feeding people who are food deprived. He does what he does because he believes that entrepreneurship is one of the most powerful forces for positive social change. In support of that desire to make things better, Warren has served on one of the on the boards of the the Fringe of Toronto Theater Festival, Neighborhood Information Post, Street Kids International, and the Funding Network. Warren, quite a story. <laughs> and uh, I, I would love to uh, to hand it over uh, to you so that you can kick us off and uh, help us through planning for the future. It will be my pleasure. Thanks so much. Um, so things have changed a little since last we spoke. Uh, I was on one of these webinars back in April. And back in April, you know, everything was, was kind of scary. No one knew if things were going to shut down, if people were going to buy anything, whether we'd be able to deliver services at all. So when I spoke in April, I was advising you that you really need to focus on cash flow, secure your supply chains, communicate like mad. 
Now, as it so happens, those aren't bad things to pay attention to at any time. But since then, I understand that for a lot of you, as Joe just said, it's been a pretty banner season, and that's fantastic. And I don't want to be a downer on the whole thing. By all means, celebrate. Enjoy your success. At the same time, remember this. Smooth seas don't make for bad... Or sorry, smooth seas make for bad sailors, right? So here's what I'd like you to remember. Whatever your plans were at the beginning of 2020, the world changed. And therefore, it's really important that you take a breath and think about what's coming. What happened to most of you was, you know, 2020 started, COVID hit, then it was reactive, and now you're reacting still and things are better. But there hasn't been a lot of that long-term thinking and planning. So today, before we get into the kind of the open panel discussion, I want to give you what I'll call the 15 minute MBA. So you'll be able to plan for the next year and so on. So I'm gonna just share my screen here. If this will work, there it is. Just give me one second. I just gotta share the uh, particular application. And there we go. Can you see that okay, Joe? We can, absolutely. So at the rest of our panel, we'll just turn off our cameras so that uh, we don't overtake your slide deck. No worries. So I'm gonna talk about just a couple of frameworks that should help as you go into this. As you're getting into the end of the year, you wanna start planning out for next year. And when I talk about strategy, this is what I mean by it. How do I deploy my scarce resources of time, team, and money to achieve a particular objective? That's all it is. People get sometimes scared when they hear the word strategy, that it means something really big and complicated and something people at MBA schools teach. But this is all it is, and it happens at a few different levels, right? You can get brand organizational strategy, you can have operational strategy, you can have HR strategy and marketing strategy. What we're talking about, or what I'm going to talk about right now, and hopefully I'm going to ask some of the panelists about this, is operational strategy. And by operational strategy, this is what we're talking about. How do we create value for the business as a going concern? You may have heard the term valuation, like basically, what is a business worth? as a going concern. Now, there are only three buckets. I, I try to take complex stuff and distill it down to something simple. So there are only three buckets of activities that drive all value. And when you understand that, then you can start to focus. And one of the reasons this is so important is for most organizations and most entrepreneurs, what they do is they play whack-a-mole all year, that they're trying to fix everything at once. They start the year and there's 23 things they wanna do. They work on all 23, nothing gets finished. They're exhausted, but not a lot has changed. And so what we wanna do is get you focused on very specific activities that are gonna drive value. So the first bucket that does this using very sophisticated language is get them to pay. Those are all the ways that we try to get people to buy from us. Then the other bucket is controlling our costs. Now the difference between those two is your yearly value and yearly value divided by risk is what creates value or valuation. And what I mean by risk is, what is the probability that that yearly value is going to continue or grow into the future? That's it. This is the universe of strategic thinking in terms of the big buckets. Now, once you choose a bucket that you're gonna play in, you then have to think about, well, what can I do with it? What are the levers I can pull? Well, under get them to pay, there's only three levers to pull. There's get more people paying, there's get people to pay more often, or get them to pay more money every time they do pay. Now there's hundreds and hundreds of tactics within these, but in terms of a strategic focus, this is the universe of marketing. There's only those three levers that you can pull. Under controlling our cost, there's only two major levers, which are your variable cost and your overhead. Now each of these have two sub levers and they're fairly important to understand. So the first is what I would call purchases. When we think of costs, we often think about, well, how much money do I have to spend on something when I buy it? But there's another thing that influence costs, and those are your people and processes. And that's really important because that how efficient and effective you are using those resources will really drive your costs. And I'm just gonna take just a couple seconds to talk about that because there's a concept that's really important to understand called organizational drag. Studies show somewhere between 25 and 30% of all payroll dollars are wasted. And they're wasted for these three reasons. Either your processes are ineffective, like you bring 20 people to a meeting when only five are needed, you know, or the meetings go on too long, or you've got processes where things are just doubling up or tripling up that are unnecessary. The people, if you've got the wrong people, you've got the people poorly trained, you've got people in the wrong seats, 
um, or there's a cultural problem. that You just don't have a culture that defines itself or operates as high performance. Any, any or all of those drag down your effectiveness and efficiencies, which means that your cost structure is higher than it. If you can move 30% right, of, of payroll dollars wasted to 20% of payroll dollars wasted, your cost structure is gonna change dramatically. Now, the second framework that I wanna talk to you about is I call it why you profit because, so that's the strategy. You're gonna choose one of those three buckets and you're gonna choose which levers you're gonna play it. But then you gotta figure out, is this actually having a positive impact? And so there are eight and only eight numbers that drive all profitability in the universe for any business, whether it's your business or General Motors or the coffee shop on the corner. It's all the same, it's the chassis of one all businesses sit. And it's called why you profit, because your business comes from sort of two, two paths, either new prospects or repeat prospects. And they behave differently, and there's different numbers associated with it. So let me show you. So the first thing on the why you profit is new leads. So there's a set of activities that produce leads. But those leads are not customers yet, right? There's another set of activities that convert them so that's like your sales skills and your unique selling proposition and your buying methodologies and all that kind of stuff. Your leads then by your multiplied by your average dollar sale, right? The, the transaction size for each purchase, those three numbers together um, are what combine the revenue that you get off your new leads. But then you've got repeat leads and there's a different set of activities that bring them back and they're gonna come back in different numbers. And their conversion rate is going to be different. Generally speaking, repeat leads have a higher conversion rate. And their average dollar sale will be different. So those six numbers together are what produce revenue. Now, if you just stop there for a second, when people think of marketing, they often think of just new lead generation. But when you understand that all six of these numbers drive revenue, then all of a sudden you start to see that customer satisfaction, customer journey, customer communications, range of services that you offer, sales skills, communication skills, all those things are marketing and that drive revenue. But we're not in the business just to do revenue. So revenue times your gross margin equals what's called your gross profit. Your gross profit minus your overhead is what gives you your net profit. So all profit in the world is those eight numbers in orange. Now where it gets interesting is what happens if you just do a little bit bitty tiny increase. So I'm gonna show you um, just a regular small business in your industry and some of the numbers that they may be generating. So they may get 50 leads. So this is you know, decent size. So they get 50 leads. Um, they have a 45% conversion rate and their average dollar sale is $10,000. So this is a you know decent small business, not a bad conversion rate. The repeat leads are 65. So they must do a good job. People come back to them in bigger numbers. Their conversion rate is 60%, so they, they sell more to their repeat customers. And those repeat customers buy a little bit more from them on the second job, $15,000. That means their revenue is 810. Their gross margins are 55%, leaving a gross profit of 445. Their overhead is 300 grand, leaving a net profit of 145. Now, now this is where it's nothing up this sleeve, nothing up this sleeve. This is where it gets super interesting and powerful when you understand this. With just a little itty bitty tiny 7% increase in each of these numbers, watch what happens down here to this profit number. So that 50 leads becomes 53 and a half. That is just three and a half more leads over the entire year. That's crazy easy. If you're like most entrepreneurs I meet, you're probably using two to three dominant marketing tactics there are hundreds, right? And most people, they haven't studied how to deploy those marketing tactics better. So just tweaking those marketing tactics will produce more leads. So three and a half, that's like super easy. Conversion rate goes from 45 to 48.2%. If you have no sales training, I've been working with a couple of people recently who haven't had sales training and they're, they're selling a lot, but not nearly as much as they could because they just, their methodologies aren't sound. Um, I tripled a guy's conversion rate in one 45 minute meeting just because he didn't have any sales methodology. So again, a 3% increase, stupidly easy. And then the average dollar sale goes from 10,000 to 10,700. That's a simple price increase or a bundling or an additional service added on. So the same thing happens on the repeat side, just a little 7% increase in each of those numbers. That leads to a revenue now 
of $990,000. So because they paid attention to organizational drag, they've improved their margins from 55 to 58.9%, leaving a gross profit of 583. Now, I'm assuming to get there, maybe they had to hire somebody or they spent a little money on marketing, so their overhead went up. Their overhead went from 300 to 321. What's the net profit now? $262,000. That, my friends, is an 80% increase in profitability by just little 7% number increases in each of those areas. If you try to get an 80% increase in profitability by focusing just on lead generation, <laughs> you gotta be really freaking good at lead generation. But under this approach, you just gotta be a little itty bit better in some key areas. Now how this sort of drills down into the strategy, so you're saying, okay, so I'm gonna play in this bucket, I'm gonna pull these levers, how do you know whether it's working? By tracking those numbers. Outside of, there's two, there's two things that don't affect the numbers. If you have a strategic focus of wanting to get more personal time for yourself or have some social impact that isn't, isn't related to your profits, those are fine strategic objectives, but those are the only two that don't fall within this model. Every other strategic activity you engage in should have a definable outcome in one, of those, one or more of those eight numbers. And so you need to tie it to those. And ideally, before you start, you should be saying, I'm pursuing this activity to improve this number or these numbers. And when you do it that way, it's really easy to tell whether your strategy is working or not. Now, when you're doing your strategy, this will be the second to last thing I'll tell you. It's the seven steps to success in strategy. And there are seven steps to go through this. The first is doing a meaningful SWOT analysis. Now, stopping right there, a lot of people don't do this. And there's some tools out there that are sold to entrepreneurs to do what's called a one-page strategic plan. And there's a few different organizations that, that move that kind of idea. I have nothing, I don't have a problem with that as an outcome. My problem with it is they don't do this first step well. And so you, what tends to happen is people are trying to solve a symptom rather than a problem. When you do a SWOT analysis, you get to the problem. So SWOT means strengths and weaknesses. Those are internal to the organization. Where do we rock? Where do we suck? And then opportunities and threats, what's what's out there that we can take advantage of, what's out there that might bite us. And when you do that analysis, then you're going to have a better sense of what's possible. And so then you set your goals. Now, some people say, why don't you set your goals first? And the reason I do it second is the SWOT analysis shows you the constraints that you're operating on. If you're operating at 70% capacity and you randomly set a goal of doubling your revenue, how are you going to achieve that when you're already at 70% capacity? That means you're going to have to add a whole bunch to your capacity. And you may or may not have the cash to be able to do that right now. So when you do the SWOT first, you actually set more realistic and meaningful goals, which means you then believe in them, which means you and your team are more likely to buy into them and then succeed at them. You then have to choose one strategic focus. Now, this is hard for people because usually when you do the SWOT analysis, you're going to look at a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and... When I do a SWOT with people, usually when I ask them to do it initially, they come back to me with 14 to 25 items. And then when I get done with them, there's probably 150. I actually created a tool called the Business That Matters Playbook that I take people through. And it actually asks you about 350 questions and it automates your SWOT analysis. It just takes your answers and populates them in a SWOT automatically. So you don't even have to think about it. And then out of that, it looks big. Like it looks like, wow, there's a whole lot of stuff here. But when you examine it, what you'll see is there's like two or three dominant themes that all the things on the SWOT analysis are telling you. And so you're going to look at those themes and then say, there's one of them that if I really focus on is going to drive me to my goals most successfully. So you choose that. And then you say up to three, maybe four strategic priorities. No more than that. If you do more than that, you're back into playing whack-a-mole, right? When you play whack-a-mole, nothing gets done. So you got to narrow, and I'll just say this. The people who try to do 23 things in a year, they wind up getting virtually nothing done and they're exhausted and not much changes. If you every quarter work on just two things in your business, at the end of the year, you will have made eight improvements in your business. You find me five businesses that have made eight significant improvements in their business over the course of a year. There's not that many. And the reason is because they don't do this, right? But when you do this, it's much easier to make those kinds of significant improvements. And then you still don't have a plan yet. So what you have to do is then select a tactic 
tactics to achieve those. So if your priority is to generate new leads, you then got to figure out what are the marketing techniques that you're going to deploy, for instance, or the sales techniques. And then you still don't have a plan. You need to assign and schedule them. If they're not scheduled, then you're going to wait and things are going to get done later. And then you're going to be scrambling to get it all done. And then finally, you've got to execute, implement, and review. And there's some methodologies to hold people accountable to make sure they get done. And when you actually use the plan as your boss and make sure that you're following on a week-by-week -week basis, then you're able to get it done. If you don't, if you do a plan and then just react to stuff that's happening to you, then the plan gets shunted aside and it's a waste of your time, right? But when you actually spend the time to focus on it and use it as your boss, it'll change your life and change your business. Now, Given that for a lot of you, things are going well this season, I'm going to suggest a few areas for you to think about. And perhaps, you know, with the panelists, we can dive into this in our conversation. Now, the basic idea behind what I'm about to say is that smooth waters make bad sailors. In other words, if fish are jumping into your boat, you may not appreciate how hard fishing can be. So don't be thinking you're a rock star just because you're making money right now. And I've spoken. So I'm going to start up here with uh, this area. Oop, what happened? There it is right there. So start playing in this. So I've spoken with different folks in your industry, which leads me to believe there's probably three things in here you want to think about. One is your unique selling proposition. I've looked at a bunch of websites from, from people in the industry. Not everybody have their, what I call their USP really clear. So you got to be clear on how you and everyone in your business talks about your company and make sure it's framed in terms of benefits to your customer. Now, some of you I know will say, I'm not that unique compared to your fellow association members. So think about clustering unique uniquenesses. I call it the three uniques. Who do you cater to? What three things about you make you special to them? Get clear on that. Second, hone your sales skills. Right now, while things are good, learn how to build rapport. Learn how to ask good questions. Positioning your offering. Prepare a proposal rather than a quote. Do the right follow-up. Practice these things now while things are good so you'll have the chops when things are tougher. And third, think about the customer experience. Here's something you must understand. Mere satisfaction is a zero predictor of loyalty in the absence of emotional connection. Gallup has done a bunch of studies on that. So if you want them to come back to you, you simply cannot rely on the fact that you built them something they like, right? You've got to build a customer experience that builds trust. Second area, you got to think about your culture. Make it a place where people like to work and are inspired to do good work. Culture is a leading indicator of brand. In other words, if you build a great culture, you're going to build a great reputation in the market. And then finally, let's talk about risk. Okay, so things are good right now. But what does that mean? People are having work done because they're stuck at home. I don't know what's going to happen, so I'm not being a naysayer. I'm just saying, what does that mean for next year? Are people going to take off on vacations and use their money for that next year because they didn't get to this year? And does that mean there'll be less work? Are they making all their capital investments this year? We don't know. But this means a few things you need to think about. First, back to what I said in April, preserve your cash. Right? You don't know what's going to happen necessarily and come next May or June. So make sure you've got the right cash reserves. Um, sell phase two of jobs now if you can. Another item, survey some of your customers about why they chose to do it this year and what their plans are for next year, and then plan accordingly. And then finally, think about building relationships further upstream. What happens before your customers hire you? Do they, do they do interior work first? Do they work with architects or contractors first? Can you build relationships with those kinds of folks to get insights now about what might be happening or to get referrals? And once you have some information about what people are intending next year, Think about what the servers, service offerings you need to offer, you need to offer um, for those folks next year. All right. So there's your 15 minute MBA. I hope that was 15 minutes. Um, now I want to try to I want to engage our panelists here um, and see what we can, what kind of conversation we get. I'm just going to start a un, un did I tell you? Sorry, I did. I turned off my screen. So one of the things I want to ask of you guys right now. Yeah, so at the beginning of COVID, things were pretty scary, right? Like no one knew what was going to happen. And when I was speaking to people, there were things like, well, we're going to have to lay people off or we're going to have to maybe wind down. So what decisions did you make early on in the face of that that allowed you to go from, my God, we may have to lay people off and manage business drops to successfully meeting accelerated demand? 
Like that's a big shift in thinking. And I know some people were either actually laying off or thinking about laying off. And so what, like how, what kind of decision making did you engage in? What were the inputs to the decision making that allowed you to make that shift from fear to sort of taking advantage of a new opportunity? Who wants to tackle first? I'll, t I'll take a stab at it, Warren, if you can. I, I think there was a big pivot change. Um, the early phase when the risk was really high and the uncertainty was high, um, a big part of it was about preserving the business, protecting our employees, um, maintaining the business so that it could be functional. And we also, all of us in Canada experienced uh, a lot of government intervention early. So even, I know we laid off a bunch of staff and then literally four days later brought them all back because the programs were changing that quickly. So there was a lot of dynamics at play in the spring that we've managed to flatten out over the year. Um, and, and then I think with some of the discussion and what you just brought to us today, it's not that different right now. As we look at the future, again, managing the risk, there's significant uncertainty um, and a certain amount of, you're right, not complacency in business, but there's so much pent up demand. There's so many people at home um, and there's so many opportunities to have conversations that would historically we normally don't have mostly because people have time um, and presence to deal with it. So in many ways that risk became lower. I don't think it disappeared, um, but those that were actively pursuing it, we, we saw early on with the task force here in some of these web webinars that were or town halls we were offering, lots of uh, demand, lots of people participating. So I think a lot of people did the right things right in the beginning, which really set them up so that they weren't behind the cart when obviously we got back to work and that pent up demand unleashed itself. Um, because we most people hadn't shut down far enough that it was, it was going to cause harm. So I, I think that part of the reason we're having this timing of the, the town hall today was let's revisit it. Let's understand what we've all experienced and really set a plan in motion for uh, th this coming fall and the spring to make sure that we're focused on sales and development how we run our business and for us a lot of it culture internally and culture externally was a was a big deal nice anybody else had had any different kind of experience with that well, if i can add to that i guess um we i started off 2020 thinking this is going to be you know, we had a great year in 2019 2020 is going to be even better we're going to play everyone was going to have a great year in 2020 and um then the uh, wheels fell off the cart um, we had done a budget based on, on what we thought was going to happen for 2020. Um, we were looking at 20% uh, increase and we we're going to have some huge profit. And we we're going to work on our processes so that we had uh, um, better uh, gross margin. And then we're looking at, you know, this pandemic and, and this, this could shut everything down. So we did another budget based on doing way louder. I think it was a 20% reduction in work as opposed to a 20% increase. Um, so we, we kind of dialed through that that whole process to see how you know, what what cuts we needed to do to, to meet that budget, um, and then when we were allowed to go back to work, it was more about okay, well we need to do another budget now because um, that that twenty percent decrease isn't going to happen. What's it going to be? Well, we're looking right now at about a fifteen percent increase, um, but the costs of of um, dealing with the pandemic, the cost was dealing with with uh, material shortages with, um, um, anyway, there's just a lot of costs involved in just with people um, that, that are really affecting the bottom line or affecting our gross margin, which is affecting our bottom line. Um, and it's something that we're, we're looking at trying to figure out, you know, how do we fix this? And is that, a, is that a common experience for everybody that even though business is up, profit margins are down? Uh, uh, certainly for us, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so what, I, I, sorry, go ahead, Peter. I was just going to say I'd echo uh, uh, Dave's and Alan's sentiments. Uh, obviously, the spring was was uh, constant change in terms of our strategy. I think I did, did six budgets in March and April, um, looking at all the possible scenarios and responding to the different programs coming out. Um, and we did obviously get back to work. Uh, we had already sold most of our year. Um, our challenge for absorbing additional work is our our ability to hire staff. 
we were already expecting to run at 100% capacity with our staff this year. So we lost many weeks in the early spring. Uh, a few of our jobs were able to run in April, but uh, uh, my sales are probably going to be down this year still just because I can't overcome that shortfall because uh, I can't run much more than 100% capacity. And uh, I, I haven't been able to hire staff, enough staff. I have had a few hires. And, uh, and then as Dave was mentioning, the costs due to material shortages and productivity uh, difficulties has limited me in terms of increasing that efficiency and productivity. And what's the, what's the challenge with getting, finding labor? Is it like people taking advantage of CERB? Is it just a generalized labor shortage? Um, like what's, what's the obstacle to finding the people that to allow you to scale up? I think the hard, part of it, is the, um, um, CERB is part, is, is, is part of it. I thought that there'd be a huge amount of, uh, um, um, food industry workers who would come and work and, and want to push a lawnmower, but that's not the case. Um, we're a specialized, um, profession and, um, construction was already busy. We get a lot of, you know, employees that are kind of moved between construction and landscape. And we weren't, um, those people are all working. Um, they were allowed to work, or a lot of the construction people were allowed to work all the way through the pandemic. Um, and then CERB has kept the people that were marginal um, sitting at home, in, in my opinion, because they, um, they didn't have to work for that money. They're not making much more to be out working, minimum wage, um, CERB almost covered minimum wage. Um, you know, even students, they go, we're in Waterloo and we've got uh, two universities and a college. Well, those students, they all went home. Mm. They didn't stay for the summer. And so there's a whole pool of employees that, that typically work in, in, our, in our maintenance division. Um, we had a few, uh, but not the kind of employees that we had, not, not, the, not the kind of uh, um, pool that we've had in the past. And, and again, they got they were qualified for CERB too. So if if, um, if they didn't have expenses, they they, they could um, they could live off of CERB for the summer. And did any of you meet this increase in demand and challenge on the cost structure with price increases on your side to customers? I know, I know my, my my pipeline runs you know six months ahead, so it's very hard for me to recoup. The additional costs for this summer, because most of this work was pre-sold last fall or over the winter. Um, and in terms of charging for work that I'm currently selling for next summer, uh, it's I'm still competing against uh, you know the marketplace. So I mean we're adding inflationary costs, and we're making sure we're recovering our actual costs. Uh, in terms of additional costs, if it takes me an extra 10 hours to lay a thousand square feet of flagstone because of our protocols, I can include that in my current estimates. So in that sense, we are recovering um, our actual costs for doing the work, but I'm probably going to be uh, short those hours this summer. Yeah. We're, we're a little more fortunate, Warren, in the sense that we're a service company compared to the design build um, side of it. So labor shortage has been an issue in previous years. So one of our strategies pre-COVID was to hire 30% more employees. Um, that's translated well this year, particularly in light of what's gone on. There hasn't been as many people in there. Now we, it seems that our hiring process, there's less competition for those that are coming in. Um, but at the same time, our absenteeism is a way up. So there's probably a week that doesn't go by where 15 to 20% of the time we have that, like literally almost every day we have at least one person off with a symptom. Um, so that's become the kind of norm that we've had to overcome. So we were fortunate in our sense that we were building capacity already um, because we're in the service sector for absenteeism and in, in low or high turnover in the workforce. So that's played out well for us, but that was, Partly luck too. What about you, Lindsay? Um, luck certainly came into it a bit for us. We had a couple staff um, not return, um, and so early on we didn't replace them. We let them let them walk and reduced our our 
um, staffing level a bit. Um, we tend to target um, experienced professionals as opposed to summer students. Um, and so, you know, I actually had a chat with Dave at one point in April where, you know, we were talking about maintenance crews and he said, well, if you run a crew of four, turn it into a crew of three, give them the same list, they'll get it done. And uh, <laughs> we turned a crew of four into a crew of two and gave them the same list and they got it done. <laughs> so um, our numbers are actually much better on maintenance than they've, they've been. Um, and then we don't do much in the way of hardscape. Uh, we're primarily design and softscape install. Um, design side, we've certainly increased our prices um, because the demand is off the charts on the design side. Um, and softscape is already pretty lucrative, so we haven't touched our prices there. Uh, but we haven't run into the same supply shortages um, that the hardscape side has, has seen this year. Interesting. We also a little bit, serve was kind of a, a Achilles heel to the HR side of things, but at the same time, the wage subsidy um, that was offered was a significant bonus in April, May for a lot. June was hard because we were just so busy. It was hard to, to, to carry those numbers forward. But a lot of guys, again, with the with the lower demand in the beginning, the wage subsidy, the profitability was up and it's bumped in. You know, I'm more, more planning and realizing that this, the business curve is probably going to flatten over the winter and next spring. We won't see these big swings and the injection of cash that we saw this year. So I'm actually more anticipating making sure we have good strategies going into next year, realizing that these programs won't be available to help uh, offset some of the pain that we experience going through this risk. Yeah. I, and I, I think that's really important for everyone to consider. I, I, you know, there's a few people who think, Oh, you know, the government helped us. They'll help us out again. You know, you got to think, Trudeau's got a minority government. Um, deficits are going up. You now got a new conservative leader who's going to be talking about deficits. And, you know, they're at risk at any point of in a minority government of seeing it fall. So I think you're going to see a lot more reticence to be ratcheting up more deficits in this kind of stuff would be my guess. Um, now, I heard three of you talk about doing budgeting. You know, and so part of this conversation is planning. How important was that for your ability to navigate through this? I wouldn't have uh, been able to sleep at night if I didn't have that budget because it, it told me that, that things were going to be okay. If I, if you know, whatever scenario came out, I could have a plan for that. And, and as things kind of changed, you're able to, okay, well, let's switch to this budget. Let's, and I ended up, like Peter said, I did about six different budgets between the time from the beginning of the year when we were aiming for 20% growth to now when um, I'm planning for my next budget going into 2021 because it, like like uh, like you were saying, things are going to flatten. My feeling is that things are going to flatten. Um, I don't think it's going to bottom out, but I think things are going to flatten out and the demand isn't going to be quite as what it was. So can we, and I'd like to hear from the other two as well. And the reason I'm asking this, because I, I often speak to a lot of smaller business owners who will say, well, budgeting is a waste of time because I don't know. And it just stresses me out and that kind of thing. But having you know heard from a couple of you saying you have to redo your budget, like the point is it isn't accurate all the time and you have to mm -hmm. keep shifting and rethinking and replanning as new information comes in and just, you know, how important that is. Well, a big part of it is having that benchmark that you put thought into that is really tested against your experience and history in your business. So you understand what your overheads are uh, in your growth plans, your marketing costs, all those things that you build into your business over time and get a greater and greater appreciation and understanding of how they fit into your mix for your delivery. So when things started changing, it's that's, I don't know, budgets are always a funny thing for me because I think a budget is something that's more stat, it's set, it's, it's how we're going to operate and how everything's in balance. We relook at our budget and apply new metrics to see how far off my guesstimation things are so I can adjust different pieces of it. But I still keep aiming for it versus dramatically trying to change it. But yeah, this year was a it was a very different year than I'd, I'd historically looked at my numbers. Um, more because it's just how do I stick with that budget and that's the locked in thing for the year. So I either come out ahead of it or behind it um, or do I adjust it as we go? So for, for us, it was just that, that benchmark that I just kept looking at and how far out are the numbers on different scenarios 
um, as we either laid staff off, brought them on to programs. We didn't have any revenues coming in. What's my cash flow going to look like? Um, and then again, with the, the luxury we had here in Canada with, I don't know how we're paying for it all yet, but having this injection in so many different ways of cash coming in, whether it's into my customers' hands or into my business's hands or my employees' hands, it was all balancing a lot of things out that were risks for us. Um, so now when I look at next year's, I'm, I'm going to put a bit of those two um, into play and try and look at what this new flatline or, or the, what this new reality might look like if I take some of those uh, risk managers out of my equation. How's that going to change? Because of the, how's that going to change my outcome, my profitability? And more importantly, too, for me, how I'm going to approach my sales uh, engine for next year, because one of the most important things we can't let our foot off this, this the gas of developing new relationship, new opportunities uh, in a challenging time. So it's it's a little weird right now that we haven't had to do that much to generate business this year. Um, generate business to fulfill where our bench strength was. It was really hard to increase your bench strength, your capacity, uh, if you went at a hard sales mark. But I don't think any of us realistically we're comfortable doing that with the amount of risk that was here. But now going into next year, I think it's just be super cautious about what you experienced this year as you plan out your next year's strategy and plan. And what are each of you doing as far as cash planning, you know, going into winter and next year? <laughs> Putting as much under my pillow as I can. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> now, it's 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 folks, Cause it'd be interesting. I don't sure. know. Peter, you don't do snow. I do snow. Uh, Dave, you do snow. Lindsay, I don't think you do snow. No. So for me, it's there always is a 12-month cash flow, but I think it's a, I run a different strategy. And for me, my snow is pretty stable um, for the most part compared to my seasonal business. But I think it would be a different strategy for a business that's coming into the winter time um, and do, does a capital investment with no cash inflow over the winter time. So they really need they're, they're used to cash preservation from November, December-ish through till March. Um, compared to a company that has a, a full winter line that's generating cash into it. So COVID caught us all off guard and outside of our budgets and, and strategies hitting us pretty hard in February, March, they would, anybody that went into last winter would have already had their plan, which is praying to get to spring. It'd be inter interesting to hear your thoughts about how, how we should look at it differently now that we, there's potential for a similar outcome in the spring knowing what we do now going into the winter, which we didn't know going into last winter. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the, that's what I was alluding to in my talk is I think, have you, have any of you started to have those conversations with customers? Cause basically what we're facing is a big unknown, right? And understanding like there's those two theories at least, you know, one is that people did it now while they were stuck at home. I know, I know people who are saying, as soon as this thing gets lifted, if there's a vaccine, I'm buggering off on a vacation next year because this being at home was awful. Um, and other people may say, you know what, it was kind of nice being at home and I'm going to make my home even, you know, a nicer place because that's where we hang out. I don't know which way is going to dominate for next year, but I would think you'd be wise to mm -hmm. be having those conversations with customers about what their intentions are. And there's a third piece too that I hear from customers is the piece where maybe a pool is going in their dream plan next year, or the year after. Yeah. But because now all of a sudden we got locked up at home, and what are we going to do? We can't. We we have travel money that we're not going to spend this year. We just moved our capital project up two years. Right. So now it's what's what's in the pipeline um, that was not going to be in the pipeline already. So I think there's a, there's three strategy hit two of them pretty good, yeah. but it's something else I'm hearing from customers. We're not in the design build sector but there's a lot of people that bump projects forward. Right. Uh, well, what I'm suggesting is you be very proactive about that. Well, you know, in our um, maintenance and snow business, we're looking at who are the best clients to be working with right now. Um, it's obviously not working with the, uh, the food service companies. We used to have a bunch of them. And over the, the last, over the last year, um, I don't think we have any anymore. Um, retail businesses, we're not, you know, retail is going to go all, in my opinion, it's going to go all online. So um, we're not looking at doing chopping plazas and that kind of work. Um, we're looking at um, there's some other sectors that we're trying to uh, anything office buildings. We do a, a handful of office buildings, and I used to think they were great, but no one's using them. So 
and they're not going to want to spend a whole lot of money maintaining and and clearing snow in a parking lot. Some of them may end up just doing fire rigs at these at these buildings that are sitting vacant. So we're looking at what sectors we should be working in um, because we've kind of over the years worked for everybody. Um, it's looking at who's going to um, be the who's most the to build and 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 target our marketing on on those on those groups and 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 going for the ones and and like i said before sell 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 that's my that's my long range um cash flow policy is just sell more and just keep selling yeah locking up the agreements that's now. Right. Locking multiple on the and, like, and a multi-year yeah. contract doesn't you don't want to have so many teeth in it that somebody uh, doesn't want to sign it or or feels feels um risk at risk signing it um, but when you get a long-term contract three or four years with a client and and go in with the with the idea that yeah if you run into trouble, let us know. We'll work. We'll make changes. We'll make it work for you. And we've done that over the years. Were you going to say something, Peter? Too. Well, I, I mean, I we've obviously done some planning and discussions with uh, in our team in terms of how we sell for for uh, the upcoming year. But we've also been very careful in terms of our cash flow planning. So, um, uh, and it's about engaging our team to to know how to sell and how to lock up those contracts for us. Like we're, we're selling stuff for June right now of next year. And, uh, and clients are giving us deposits. Like I was amazed in March, I got a huge deposit for a residential job. We started two weeks ago, last March. And that was like, I thought for sure everyone was gonna clam up, but, uh, but I got paid on my receivables. I got, I got paid deposits and I, I got uh, deferrals on some of my equipment payments. I did everything that I could to make sure I was uh, secure. And it turned out to be okay for us this summer, but we're preparing for the worst for next year. Obviously we're hoping for the best, but uh, we're preparing for worst case scenario where maybe sales will be down again next year. Tim's got a big problem with that line yeah. here. But it's uh, true of a lot of business. I think and wise advice is, is probably the cash preservation, but if, if you've incurred debt, or when we spoke in the spring, a lot of business, a lot of people were talking about were in panic mode because they didn't have a rainy day fund built up because they're at the end of the winter, their reserve to get them through winter have been exhausted. And now here, right when they're right about to go to work, they potentially can't. So I always look at this scenario that across the membership is we got kind of gifted a golden key in the sense that there's all this pent up demand, people were staying at home. Are you paying down your debt loads? Are you putting cash away so that if there is that rainy day next spring, you have the ability to lean on that again? That's not an overhead burden that's going to handicap your ability to maneuver uh, come next spring. And related to that, I would suggest it's not, while not taking on more debt to secure an increased line now, yeah if you think that may be something you need for next year. Like right now, if you've been selling a whole bunch of stuff and the banks are like, whoo, things didn't get as bad as we liked, and boy, this landscape industry is doing well, they're a great place for us to extend uh, extend some debt to. You don't have to incur the debt, but to have access to it in case you need it now, because if yeah. things if if demand does soften next year, and there, then you're saying, I need a loan, the banks are gonna be tighter with their cash. They're already a little apprehensive of small business right now, but 100% correct. Is when I, in the spring when I was talking to businesses that weren't paying in ourselves, again, a bit of it's well, luck or strategic plan. We were planning for a rainy day over the last two years, mostly because there's just so much energy and sales in, in business period in Canada um, that a lot of economists were saying that there could be a correction any time in the future. We don't know when it's going to be, but we doubled all our lines of credits uh, last fall. No idea there was a pandemic coming. Um, or what we would experience in the spring. But that, in hindsight, that was good play. If you didn't do it last year, now's the second best time. You're going in with good positive cash flow. Log as I'm talking, to you, I've got more cash in the bank than they've ever had in their bank. This is the time to negotiate with your lenders. Just don't spend it, just have it there so yep. that you get room to move uh, without going to the bank when you're under pressure. Just gives you breathing room. Yeah. Right. The other thing I know- Oh, sorry, go ahead. You were getting cl close on time here, but I wanted to touch a little bit just so it doesn't get lost. You'd mentioned it in your 15-minute uh, opening there, customer experience is something that we've really focused on this year. 
um, making sure, especially since we have an opportunity, I think probably everybody on this panel can say they've seen their customers more than they've ever seen them in the past. They're usually at home watching you with the whole family actively because the number of pictures I see on social media about the road getting paved. So we got entertainment today uh, or the landscapers here doing work in the backyard of the pools getting built. So there's something for the kids to, to watch or do. It's the new entertainment factor. <laughs> but there's more people paying attention to us than ever before. This is the time to take that opportunity and make sure not only are we coaching our, our staff and team members how important that experience is, it's, the, it's great that you build a perfect wall, but how how well did you engage your customer? What were the conversations? How neat were you on site? How did you follow up with them after? Both, all the way from the leadership and ownership of the company right down to the guy that's picking up after everybody when the, the crew leaves every day. These are almost in, the most important, I would believe the, the most important tools that you have at your disposal to ensure as you showed that why, the retention and reoccurring revenue from your existing customers is going to be key. And I, I'm glad that was actually my next question on here because one of, one of my expectations or thoughts that could have happened is you would either have people who are super friendly and who are being accommodating because these are new and unusual times, or there'd be people who just don't give a rat's behind and I don't care about your crew and get the job done fast. And, you know, don't tell me you got a delay because of these protocols, just get the job done. And which of those are you experiencing? And then mm -hmm. secondly, related to what you're saying, I, I believe this is an elevated level of training that's needed for frontline crews mm -hmm. because of that. Like there's going to be children there. There's going to be the dog in the yard. There's going to be, you know, one or both parents hanging out to watch or the neighbors being done, which requires a higher level of diplomacy and communication and cleanliness and all the rest of that. Yeah, and even the simple where you park your trucks in the street, all those inconvenient things. Um, are I think critically important right now that you have your eye on the ball. And to your point, when you get really busy, it's easy to forget. You know, we gotta get on the next job. We gotta get on the next job. It's easy when you're you got more work that you know what to do with to to forget those little things. And because um, and here's the kicker, I think on this because next year is an unknown. You want and I, I think this is what you have to impress on your teams. We want to have referrals and repeats. Right, like the, the big job, someone's gonna if they put in a pool this year, they might do some decking next year, right? Or they're they're gonna have a friend who they're gonna invite over for their pool, and they're gonna say, "Who did the work for you?" Well, and if they say, "Yeah, the work was good, but their crew were a bunch of jerks." You're not gonna get the referral. Right? That's, that's, that's almost the, the bigger the truth right there. Kids. The bigger truth: the number of neighbors watching all of us do construction projects, the number of irrigation jobs we sold because we did one neighbor. And now all of a sudden, all my other neighbors, you know what, I should do that this year. Um, so all of a sudden we can't get out of a neighborhood because the referrals are coming in. So it may not just be with your customer. I would include the neighbors as the immediate yeah. referral or the reoccurring revenue piece. My neighbor had, had his back fence done this year and the guy did such a good job. It's like everybody in the neighborhood is asking for his number now. Uh, how, what are you guys experiencing, Dave, Peter and uh, Lindsay? Same for me. Yeah, it's uh, referrals have always been my uh, my first choice in terms of uh, marketing and, and driving sales. It's much easier. And I know in your initial presentation, Warren, you were showing a higher uh, turnover for those uh, for those sales, the referral sales. And, uh, you know, if I could if I'm getting 50 percent on new leads, I'm getting 75 percent on referrals. Right. And uh, repeat customers. So. That's where uh, it's easy to focus, and uh, it's much easier to boost that ten percent. You know, like like in your uh, initial presentation, that's that's by far our focus. Uh, my focus. Uh, you talked about communication. I just want to touch on the communication with your employees and coaching your employees to be ambassadors for your company. Yes, because then because they will be the ones that can communicate on your behalf with your clients and project your your company's mission and vision and uh and that that is how we drive our marketing right now what's been your experience lindsay um yeah i mean to, to second peter there when you had that slide up showing 65 percent on the repeat leads immediately i went that seems really low <laughs> um <laughs> our, our experience on on repeat stuff is 
probably 85 or 90. Um, same as internally, we call it internal leads where they're, you know, they're our maintenance clients. Oh, you know, the back garden's getting a little tired, so we'll redesign it and, 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 you know, redo it. Um, those are our bread and butter and they're great because they're not people who are, you know, shopping for price. They're not getting other quotes. It's like, here's the project. Hey, how much do you want to spend? Oh, you know, we're good with 20 this year. Okay. We'll design the project to 20 and, and sold. Right. Um, so very low cost of, you know, low effort of acquisition on those ones. Yeah. Have, um, any, have any of you found the customers more critical or causing, you know, that you've had to be more attentive to the customers who are watching you or has it been okay? I, I think the customer is more demanding right now. There's two sides to it. And you mentioned this before. There is the demanding client as well as the super understanding client. And I hate to say it, but we have a client who we started a pool working for them um, at the end of April, beginning of May, and we still haven't finished yet um, due to a bazillion different delays in this one project. But that I wish every single one of my clients was like this because he's very accommodating, very understanding. When you explain this, yeah, he gets a little worked up because we're pulling out of the site. But when you say, well, the papers that we ordered – the ones that came in were not the ones that we ordered and the ones that are supposed to be here are on back order for three weeks. Um, and it's like that kind of stuff that's been happening. Um, but he has been so accommodating. Um, yet, you know, still critical with work, you know, we still have to work through things, but very accommodating. And that the, the flip side of it is the person that's sitting at home watching everything that everybody does and, and criticizing as opposed to, um, you know, I don't like the way they did it. I don't like the way your employees walk. I don't like the way they talk. You know, and it's things like that. But um, mm -hmm. and another thing I've heard is um, clients calling back for for um, warranty work from you know three to five years ago because they're now at home um, looking at everything that was ever built in their backyard and they're they're getting on the phone and saying, hey, this isn't right. Right. Yeah, communication is a big one there, as you alluded to. It's you have to actively communicate, especially when you're running into supply chain shortages. Um, the easiest way to fail customer experience is to not communicate, um, both with your team members, so that they have the, their power with the tools to to have the conversation with the customer uh, to keep them aware, and being proactive and, and staying ahead of it to keep them aware, so that they don't get any surprises. Um, no, no more of a surprise than we're going to get it as the person in touch with making sure the project gets executed on time. So there's a lot of pressure and they are home. So some see it as a, as a stress on their business. Um, others, I encourage even our team, it's an opportunity. Um, they're all there. The neighbors are there. Be courteous whose house you park in front of. If you see someone outside, make conversation with them. Mm -hmm. um, explain to them what you're doing because they're not going to be in the communication loop living two doors down. Uh, but there is a curiosity because they see your team every day. Um, so where are you? How long have you been in the project? And and some of the things that are associated with it. So there's there's lots of opportunity to make new relationships that we haven't had before because usually we work in neighborhoods that are usually void of people. Monday to Friday, what they're all out working, but this year they're not. They're home. Hey Joe, I'm just wondering, do anybody you know in the audience want to want to ask any questions? Uh, I haven't seen any pop up, but I would encourage anyone from the audience that if you do have any questions, uh, now's the time. We're kind of running right at the uh, at our hour mark. Uh, I did notice that uh, Tim had another comment, and uh, his strategy for uh, planning for the future is just, just like Dave: sell, 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 uh, yeah. and to future proof uh, his operation. What he's saying is he's booking well into next year. Uh, in order to make sure that um, you know he, he's got a viable operation through um, the future. Well, I'd encourage to Tim's comment there, Joe. Is, is a lot of guys the, the lead the lead generation is way higher than it's ever been. You're not going to close. You may even find a lot of these are tire kickers because they're seeing all this activity. They're at home. They're, they're checking out their bucket list or dream list for their house and, and fielding costs. But keep track of all these. Um, these these are going to be gold if there's not the leads coming in next next spring. Yeah. So if you can't get to them all or just, just make contact with them, even if you're overbooked, make contact with them uh, and keep them in your role of debt. Dating myself, the role of in your, <laughs> your electronic. Uh, so, have one of those. so that you intentionally with your sales team or depending on the size of your company, 
just keep touching base with them over the next 12 months. Yeah. I know a change, a change we've made for, I'll call them small internal leads is to really empower the, the senior maintenance staff to price that work and sell it on the spot. Um, because those are the little ones that are easy to fall, you know, through the cracks if they get referred back to the office and, you know, you've got more big leads coming in than you've ever had. So you're already swamped rather than like, oh yeah, Mrs. Jones needs a 12 by six area sodded in her backyard. We turn the don't, I don't, I don't need to know that. Don't send that back to me to go in price. You're already there. If you need a number in terms of like, what do we pay per roll of sod? Call and ask for that, price the work, sell it to her on the spot, and then you can put that sold job into the pipeline because, hey, that's a good little filler for the next time we're in that neighborhood, um, you know, doing a, a, say, a seven-hour job. Cool, when that seven-hour job is done, go lay those 12 rolls of sod at Mrs. Jones. All right. Yeah. Exactly. point there a little bit. Grab the little ones, too, or give the customer pricing options. It's easy when it's really busy. Dave, you mentioned the new jobs is easy to price high um, because we got so much work, but sometimes you scare away potential clients because you know that's outside my budget. But that client next year, if there's an option B that's maybe a scaled back one, just kind of keep the conversation in your notes or whatever it is. Or if you see and you feel the customer that you, you, you were too far outside their budget, keep it. If there's a market downturn or anything, those projects again will be gold. Um, if, if they still haven't done them. The idea here is to nurture those leads and not forget about them. Yeah, um, sure. Warren, um, I know that you do have a, a sales program and um, you know there's been a, a few um, members that I know have gone through that. Can you tell us um, you know, if, if, we, if we do want uh, your help, how do we get in touch with you and what is that program all about? Sure. Well, there's there's probably there's two things that I can help with, and thanks for that. One, one is like super cheap. I created a, uh, I call it the sales accelerator formula. It's basically how you handle this. It's a formula about what you do within a sales call to make sure that you stay in control and, and accelerate the sale and get to a yes. It's twenty seven dollars. <laughs> it's got like six videos. It's got a workbook and it's got a post call checklist so you can continually evaluate your own sales process. So that's just at um, salesaccelerator.com, or sorry, yoursalesaccelerator.com. Um, and like I say, it's 27 bucks. It's like, it's, I, I did it so it should be a no-brainer for people because I wanted people to just get that kind of help. It's actually, this, the formula is what allowed me to turn my sales around. When I first started as a coach, just tell you a quick story about it, it was funny. I was really struggling in my sales and I couldn't figure out why. And the organization I was with had a professional sales coach and he came out with me and he actually reported back to head office that I was the top sales guy in the country. And I went, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard because by definition, I'm not because I wasn't selling, right? <laughs> um, but what, what confused him is there were two parts of this formula I was really good at and two parts that I was missing. And then, so when I figured it out, my conversion rate went to about 85%. And so I put this program together. So oh. it's just, like I say, it's 27 bucks. You can get through it in a weekend. Um, the other thing that is interesting right now for Ontario, and I, so this may sound like a, a sales pitch, but it's actually just a really cool opportunity. There's a, there's a government grant called the Canadian Ontario Jobs Grant. And if you're a business that is of sufficient size that you've got two or three people who can get into planning with you, basically the government will pay $6 for every $1 you put in to go through strategy training and the way I've structured it. And the only reason I can do it and others can't is that software tool I created because you can be a software vendor to qualify for this training. So I created this thing called the Business That Matters Playbook and it's a software tool that automates the strategic planning process. So what I do is I train the team on how to do strategic planning and execution using the business as a case study. So at the end of the training, you leave with a fully baked out one year strategic plan, 90 day plan with people trained on how to implement and execute it. Um, so if people are interested in, in actually getting a strategic plan, it's like the best, most affordable way of doing it because of this government program. And, and I just, the only reason I'm pushing, I, I just discovered that it's been extended to March. So, you know, when you get through this sort of September rush, 
if it's <clears throat> we want to engage in to get some help doing some meaningful planning, um, it's a really great way of doing it. And if you're under the, if you're under that size, where you know you can't. You don't have two or three people that you can put through a training on it um, and you just want one-to-one -one help you can just contact me directly and we'll figure out a way that you know can probably accelerate that process but right. i tell you the, the thing i'm doing the reason i was asking it's i'm finding that because of what happened with covid no one and i'm just seeing this across the board not just your industry everywhere nobody has a clear direction of what the next year looks like and because this whole thing upset everybody's ear and everybody's been reactive, that I believe now is the time to sit down and do a, like a really detailed analysis of your business, your strengths, the opportunities that are out there, risks, and put a powerful plan together that will guide your actions. And the people that I've had go through this in the last few months, um, it's it's been really transformative. So I, I'm excited about it because I think it, it can help. Um, so thanks for that, but right. that's the that's the end of my pitch. But it's just because of this government program, it's just great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it uh, makes a lot of sense to uh, to take advantage of six dollars to every one. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, where do I sign up? Right here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Drop me an email and all. <laughs> right. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, well, thanks, everyone. I really enjoyed the conversation. And if anybody has any follow up questions or anything, just feel free. I think I think Joe, you'll send out my email, right? We will. You're pretty easy to Google. You're all over the uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think uh, I think Warren is right. Uh, smooth seas really do create poor sailors, and you know, we learn lessons in times of challenge, uh, and, and the difficult times when we're able, when we're able to overcome is when we learn those lessons. Uh, and this pandemic has proved that we're able to overcome insurmountable challenges. You know, and over the last few months, we've spent a lot of time uh, looking in the rearview mirror. And so spending more time looking through the windshield and planning where we need to focus um, and for what the future brings is really important. And no one has the crystal ball uh, to predict what act, what's actually going to happen. And uh, but taking some time to talk about what those scenarios might look like and plan accordingly. So our businesses have the longevity that we hope for. And I'll uh, say what, what Dave said, then, like the not doing the budgeting, you didn't know if you'd be in business. I'll think, like I, all my one-on-one -on -one clients that I put through the planning, uh, just a humble brag, not one of my clients has gone out of business from any industry. And there were three of them that were, were talking about shutting down. But when we did that kind of what Dave said, like budgeting out the numbers and doing a plan, they've all got through it. Um, so mm -hmm. I agree with you. With some creativity and some hard work, you can get through these tough times. Absolutely. The greatest, greatest opportunities always come out of the greatest challenges or, or greatest times of crisis. Sure. So take advantage of, of this opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Uh, Warren, on behalf of the entire COVID uh, task force, we really appreciate uh, well, your my effort. Pleasure. It's always Thanks for doing great it. work with you. Thank you. And, nice talking to you. Um, Nice talking to you. And um, we certainly hope for our audience that this discussion has provoked some thought into planning for the future of your business. Stay safe and we'll see you next time. Sure. Don't let your guard down. Thanks. Bye.